Hi everybody, this video is for section 11.1, .1, the chi-squared statistic, and today we're going to take a look at a new type of test called a goodness of fit test. So let's dive right into the example in your notes. Today we're given information on random births from a hospital over seven days of the week, the day on which they occurred, and we can see here that some days were more popular than others. Thursday was the most popular day, and it seems like those weekend days, Saturday and Sunday, were the least popular. What we'd like to know is, are the births equally distributed through the week, or are there certainly days that are more popular than others? So we're going to compare the births we have here to what we'd expect to get if the dates were equally distributed. The chi-squared statistic, the new one we're going to learn about here, allows us to compare observed counts against the expected counts. So we're going to look at comparisons here today. And the type of test we're going to do is a goodness of fit test. It allows us to compare how well these observed values fit this is why we call it a goodness of fit test, a hypothesized distribution. Okay? So what we notice here is there were 140 total days in the sample. That's very convenient because if we split that over the seven days, we would expect to see 20 births if all the days are equally likely. Certainly some variability here. Just how big is that variability? Is this enough to conclude that the dates are not equally likely for births? Okay? And the chi-squared statistic, chi-squared, notice the Greek letter chi there, looks like an italicized X. That statistic measures these differences. So we're going to dive into the conditions, the statistic, and we'll do this test from beginning to end. Okay? Let's dive right into the chi-squared statistic and its formula. Here's the formula for the chi-squared statistic. First of all, notice it's a summation. We're going to be adding things together. And for each of the days of the week, we will take the observed count and the expected count, subtract those, square that, and divide by the expected. So a couple things about this. It's a pretty easy calculation, but take a look at that numerator, observed minus expected. That kind of smells like something we've done in the past involving scatter plots. It kind of smells like a residual formula where we take observed things and expected things and look at those deviations and see how big they are and compare them as a whole. Okay. Next thing we're going to look at are the properties of the chi-squared distribution. Since we're doing a summation of things that are being squared, Notice we can never get a negative value for the chi-squared statistic. So two main things about the chi-squared distribution. First of all, the chi-squared distribution is a family of distributions that only take positive values and are skewed to the right. Okay? So they only have positive values. The lowest we can have is zero. If the expected and the observed happen to match up, we would have a chi-squared statistic of zero. So what we want to know is just how big is this statistic compared to what we'd expect to uh, observe by chance alone and they are skewed to the right. Also, there isn't just one chi-squared curve. The chi-squared goodness of fit test depends on the number of categories you have. Here we have seven categories. We're gonna have degrees of freedom here, and the number of degrees of freedom equals the number of categories minus one. So I do have some pictures of some curves here. They are from your textbook. Notice that the blue curve, degrees of freedom, when you have eight categories, is much longer, more spread out than if you only had four categories. We're just even two categories, rather, for uh, degrees of freedom equaling one. So the number of categories is very important here. And we'll take a look at all these throughout our experiences. Okay. So let's compute the chi-squared statistic from what we have here. Again, we're going to take all the observed, the expected counts, subtract it from each other, square it, divide by the expected. So on Sunday, we saw 13 births. We would have expected 20 if they were equally likely throughout the week. That's a difference of 7. We would square that to get 49 and put that over the expected, which is 20. So the calculation is here. And we're going to calculate that for each of the seven days of the week. So they're pretty easy calculations, just gets a little tedious. So on Monday, we have 23 minus 20 squared over 20. Tuesday, 24 minus 20 squared over 20. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we'll do it for each of the days. You can write those all down, put them in your calculator, and you will get a chi-squared statistic of 7.60. It's certainly different from zero, what we'd expect to get if they were all the observed and the expected were equal to each other. Just how unusual is getting a 7.60? And that's what this test is going to be all about. Okay. So before we dive into doing the test, we do have some conditions we have to meet here. The first condition is that we do need a random sample. The data need to come from a random sample or a randomized experiment. Next, we need to have a large sample size. This is a little bit different. We don't have any normality here, like we had in t-tests and z-tests. We're talking about a totally different type of curve here. But we do need large sample sizes. All of the expected counts have to be at least five. We can't have any really small categories 
where you may only have one or two, maybe even zero observations. And finally, independence. The observations have to be independent from a large population. Once we have all this, we can take our chi-squared statistic and use a chi-squared table like you see here to find a p-value or approximate a p-value and then reach some decision about our null hypothesis. So now we have enough information to actually do the test. Do the data provide convincing evidence that births are not equally distributed throughout the week? And we are going to prove this at the 5% level. One thing you're going to see that's different about chi-squared tests is instead of using symbols for the null and the alternate hypothesis, oftentimes it's easier to use narrative statements. Here's an example for this problem. The null hypothesis here would be that births are evenly distributed through the week. And we can just say that in words. It's easier to say that in words than to try to define every category. The alternate hypothesis is that births are not evenly distributed through the week. So the null and the alternate here, just much easier to write in terms of sentences. Now we could use symbols if we wanted to. Here's the way you would write the null and the alternate if you wanted to use symbols. The null would be that all of the proportions equal 1 7 versus the alternate that at least one, all we need is one, does not equal 1 7. So either way is fine, using either symbols or using narrative statements. Let's check our conditions, three conditions to check here. First of all, random sample. I would hope that these are a random sample of births from the hospital. Counts, all of our expected counts are 20. Those are all greater than five, that's good news. And finally, independence. The births are hopefully independent. I'm not quite sure here because what if there were twins or triplets on one day? Those wouldn't be independent, but I'm gonna assume independence from birth to birth here. And I'll also assume that these represent a sample from a large population of births at this hospital, that there were somehow greater than 1,400 births. Okay, now we're gonna carry out the test. We already know the test statistic, chi squared equals 7.60. We computed that earlier. The degrees of freedom is six seven categories minus one and now i want to find the p-value now using a table here and this is in the back of your textbook i look at the row for six degrees of freedom right here and i try to find that test statistic of 7.60 now i don't expect to find 7.60 i just need to know where it lies within the row and you can see here that 7.60 would lie before the lowest p-value which is 0.25 so all I know and all I really need to know is that the p-value is greater than 0.25. Now down the road, we will use technology for this. Technology will provide a p-value of 0.269. Feel free to try to find the goodness fit test on your calculator, but, uh, but technology often does lend us a hand here. So now we can do our conclusion. Since our p-value is greater than alpha, 0.269 is greater than 0.05, we cannot reject the null hypo hypothesis. These births do not provide convincing evidence that the births are not evenly distributed throughout the week. Keep in mind, I'm not accepting the null. This does not provide evidence that they are equally distributed throughout the week. It's just that I can't conclude that they are not equally distributed throughout the week. So we have to be very careful with our conclusions. Just some little nitpicky type of stuff there. So that's the essence of a chi-squared goodness of fit test, where we're trying to take our observed counts and see if they fit expected counts. A little bit different type of test, and we'll do a few examples in class.